Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. Delighted to see you. Thanks for joining us again on this fourth session on making it look terrible. And um, we've got a very fun panel today for you. We've, we've got some of our regulars, um, Dr. Sassy, who's been putting this whole series together, um, as well as Nick Harris, um, and also Harry Frank, who you will remember is the product manager for Universe. Um, and, but I'm delighted to welcome Laura onto our session this week. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, thanks for having me. Um, and Laura not only is an amazing artist and designer, but she's also created a whole range, 60 or so presets for the universe tools. And um, the, we couldn't let a month on universe go by without talking about those. So it's fantastic that you've got the time to actually spend this time with us. And the interesting thing is that Laura's pre presets are beautiful and we'll be showing those very shortly. So we thought, <laughs> on a month where we're showing how to make everything look terrible. We needed to have a balance, but also we can still show you how to make Laura's beautiful presets look terrible as well for, for all the visual reasons that we've been discussing and distressing and distorting and uh, making things interesting and communicating that visual language that we've been talking about. So um, welcome to everyone. If you've got any questions, please chuck those into the questions area. So, um, Isaac's here too, um, and hi Isaac, thanks Thanks for dropping in, say hi, and if you've got any other questions or you want to share something or ask any of the panel questions about where we're going, please do that. And also, well, just as a reminder, in case this is the first session that you're joining, I know many of you, this is not the first session because it's very nice that you join us on a regular basis every Monday. But just in case, the page I'm showing at the moment is the Maxon Training Team YouTube page. And this is where you can see all the various recordings for not only these sessions, but also many of the other webinars that we put together. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things on here that um, a quick way of finding out what the most latest upload is just to look at this top playlist where it talks about the uploads. But we have lots of content around across the whole range of the Maxon tools. So for example, if you scroll down to, here we go, Ask the Trainer, where um, Nate and Andrew came on and talked about the new updates to Trapcode and VFX Suite last week. And we've also got the latest series in the episodes that Ellie and Matt have been putting together about the intro to, or the beginner's workshop for cinema, and this is based in R25. So if you want to look at the interface updates and all the new tools that have been introduced, please have a look at those. And if you want to join live, of course, you can go to the maxon.net site, just go to events, which is under the news heading, and this lists all the things that we've got coming up. And also we've got, we're just about to update this so we can show you what's happening during October, but all through October, we have a, a whole brand new series of uh, webinars, and these are actually featuring MoGraph. So here, here's the information about that. Multi-dimensional MoGraph. So the ability to make 2D and 2.5D and 3D scenes inside cinema, and then how you can then accelerate that production and, and create really amazing graphics and designs. And so we're being joined by Ellie and Jonas and Lionel again for that series. So. Have a look out for that. If you if you want to know the link right now, it, I, we can copy and paste that into the chat. In fact, I might as well do that. And also we can um, answer that. If you want to say, hey, post the link again in the questions, then we can post that too. And don't forget also on Cineversity, cineversity.net. Oh, thank you, Greg. Greg says that sounds amazing. Thank you. Oh, appreciate that, Greg. Um, as well as all that content, go to Cineversity and there's thousands and thousands of tutorials and um, advice and forum answers to questions. Dr. Sassy answers many, many questions. So if you've got any quest any question you like, chuck those into the forum and he will answer them for you. And also um, EJ from School of Motion, EJ has for us, has made an update to the Getting Started in Cinema 4D. So you can go and watch that series now. So we're, we're just literally throwing content at you um, and wanting to answer questions. Great. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention, talking about throwing content at you, is just to do a little recap of this last month, making it look terrible. And I don't, I don't, you'd have to take my word for it because 
Dr. Sassy has done this amazing work of putting together this fantastic PDF, which essentially this breaks down into text form all the things that um, everyone's been talking about over the last few weeks. So there's an overview of the concept here. The, uh, this, by the way, is available for download. If you go to the, uh, the handout section inside the webinar software here, then you can just download this PDF right now. And if you're watching the recording, just go and check out the links in the description on YouTube as well. And that's where we'll put this link to in a few hours when the video has finished processing. But I just wanted to say that, that when we were discussing previously that, that whole idea of the, the mind map and how you can then craft your story based on those different techniques, I know that has been discussed um, to some extent, but here we go, here is the whole exhaustive text explanation of it. I don't know how you've had time to do this, Sassy. This is amazing. But Thank you. Um, this, this is just incredible. This, this is like a backup resource. And what we were thinking about, if you'd like to see more of these resources, some of you've been asking, hey, can we have a PDF? So your wishes are granted, certainly in this season. Let us know, because we'd love to support your learning in this type of format, if you like. So more on that in a second, because I'm going to ask Dr. Sassy just to talk about it and to recap where we are and what we're going to do this week. But just also, in case you're interested, here is Laura's website, lauraporat.com. And this is where you can find out or see some of the amazing designs that uh, she's created and uh, look at and find out some more about her and the, those sort, the sort of style. Because you've got a very unique, lovely style, Laura, which I find really interesting. And so if you've got questions for Laura about how um, she comes up with those things or what motivates her for doing those designs, please shout out and I'll ask in the questions area. Fantastic, great. So <laughs> let me hand over to you, Sassy. Um, so you can let us know a little bit more about this PDF and also about the, the plan of attack for what we're gonna cover in this session. I think you want to introduce where we can have t-shirts well, and tell you what, certification. We, we, will, we will do. We have inside the PDF actually on the in the downloads area. We've got information about that and how you can grab it to your free T-shirt. We'll do that at the end as well. Okay. But I just wanted to make sure that we did some housekeeping and also we didn't use all the time up with housekeeping because we've got to jump in. We've got so much to cover. So, but that's a good reminder. Thank you. Cool. So, um, shall I hand over the screen to you, Sassy? Yeah, if you like. Okay, let's do that. I will make you presenter. Okay, show my screen. Can you see all my screen and the chaos that I have at the moment? Yes. And yeah, I think it's okay. Um, first of all, this is a draft. Um, I say that because there's always something new to say about it. And what we have on this page here is pretty much the inner workings why we have done all of this and uh, i explain here also why we have these four different screens each is dedicated to one of our guests the first one was for nick the second one for max the third one was dedicated to harry and the last one is dedicated to laura and as you can see here we have an automat or a vendor machine vending machine and this is pretty much how I see universe you have a huge amount of options you just pull a door you get something and you can do whatever you want with it and this image here is from my point of view pretty much what Laura does she takes what is in universe and supplies it in many many ways that's why there are so many little screens here and um, the next part was we had a story here we do not go today there these pictures here were created by max these ideas here in the background are the ideas from nick and then we have of course here the long list of things that we can discuss with the mind map where i go in each and every single option here in the text that is of course not possible to discuss in our short time with harry we have discussed a little bit more about the workings inside of the plugins so we hope we have answered all the questions so far and today we will go to laura and with all the presets 
I thought it was a good idea maybe to create a mood board that is maybe not static because whatever I read in, in books is that we have a mood board, people put designs on it, light and, and whatnot. And when we then finally make a pitch in front of a studio or whoever wants to work with us, it's static and we have to talk to give some life to it. And I thought, what happens if we just animate the whole thing? So we see as a motion graphic artist, how it really unfolds in motion. And this is a very quick demo here. It's not really where I say, this is how it has to be. You have maybe better ideas, but to have maybe segments in the picture that connects to each other. And the idea was here to have a 2D graphic in it, then a 3D text, of course, and then something organic. So to cover maybe a wider variety with just a few elements and then have all of this running clockwise around so the eyes are following and you get really led through the whole design process. So that was the first one. And I don't know how we go further now, if we go now directly to Laura or if I show my little ideas that I have done with Laura's and other presets or I that, have that sounds good. Let, let's show, let's show you that first, um, and then we can ask. Um, we can extend that conversation to Laura. Good. So the second one, and I know that looks pretty much like uh, I I made it really terrible. What was maybe thought as a Memphis uh, Milano design at one point, and so I have added several layers of of. Um, plug-ins on top of each other. And you can see here that I have segments inside of the whole image. So we can really see how each changes over time. This was maybe a softer approach here. To close this, next one. This is a little bit more rough and I will go more rough in a second. And this is based here a little bit on displacement. And so, so I enjoy to have these like class enclosure around these objects. And I try to animate the background as well. So the size and scale changes here. And let's go to the next one. And I don't know if your eyes are already storing here. <laughs> this was more an idea how to get this feeling from uh, that last animated Superman movie where everything is a little bit uh, RGB distorted. And you see already how versatile this is, even these few elements here. And here I go really extreme and to make it terrible, distort it completely until it stops a little bit. So you can see a little bit of the content and then it goes back into something completely different. So that's maybe way too extreme and way too saturated, but it depends always on the project. And finally, something more where I had the idea when we put the graphic elements from Laura or from other preset makers on top of something, then I would love not just to have it blended over. I want to use these elements to slowly distort these things and then blend these elements in. So they have already these, what we do in animation when we pull someone really far back and then he throws the ball instead of just throwing the ball, the anticipation of things. So just more and more together to get something that is unique and so you can create your own language. This is pretty much in a nutshell what I wanted to show. Um, when there are questions, I have After Effects open with all of that, but I think you are certainly more interested in listening to Laura, what she has to say about all these wonderful setups that she has done. Is Simon already gone? Yes, he took off. Um, okay. <laughs> he so he meeting and he says he says goodbye. But I actually had a question for you, Doctor Sassy, which was yeah. And and this is also for Laura as well. Am I correct that all of those the backgrounds that you used for each of the various movies, those were a ray gun, if my memory serves me correct. And yeah. Laura, are these some of your presets that you actually designed within? 
um, Oregon or, um, and Dr. Sassy, did you alter them? Of course you keyframed some of them. I was curious sort of the, um, which presets were yours out of there, Laura? And then Dr. Sassy, I'm, I'm curious what you tweaked in a ray gun uh, within maybe one of those designs. Well, uh, Dr. Sassy has done a really good job of uh, tweaking the preset side me, so it's hard for me to see. But on the right side, uh, the hexagons, the hexagon grid, that was mine. And then he man manipulated it and distorted it, which is uh, really cool to see. Okay, so cool. what I did here is pretty much uh, this. I think I have done nothing to this preset, but what I did here on top of it is just this. And it's just a chromatic aberration. And what I love on chromatic aberration is that it pulls all things together. It gives an overall feeling to the whole area without um, changing too much. I mean, we, we want to have a strong effect, so this is maybe too much for some people, but um, what I wanted to do here is I can just switch this all off so you see it, how it unfolds. So background, another background, another background, another background, and then the animation where I have here just shadow on top of it, and I think I had here a tint effect, yes. So you can see that here as well. This is the original. And I wanted to have the colors that I have seen in the background a little bit reflected inside of this. And I thought this is a nice color, whatever. And we can go to another one. If I hope I do not bore anyone to death because that was a mood board and not a mood get board. Uh, don't save, open this. So this one is a little bit more complex already. and. The backgrounds here are already animated with just the scale. This is the only uh, parameter that I have animated here. As you can see, it's all pretty much in default. It's just here from 100% or from zero to way over 500 at 0.6 here. Yeah. So that's pretty much all there is to it. And of course, uh, the beauty of all of that is when I have an effect here, I can go into my presets and just add something else on top of that. I click here, get something, and with one click and apply, I hope it will change now. <laughs> of course, it will not. My yeah, computer right. is. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I have an iMac six years old, so please forgive me for that lazy, slow stuff here, but it's very easy. You click on something, solid in the middle, you find something else that you want, the Bauhaus, for example, and it changes. And so you can very quickly change your whole setup, and it's all based on when you take a look here, that I have separated these up front and just apply it and you get a new picture, render it out, and then you get many variations as I try to show you here with uh, these guys here. And this is then just one rendered out example and you can move on without losing stuff. Are there any more questions? Or... I, I kind of love the fact of seeing a ray gun split up on the screen like that in the, in the multiple, like how you lay that out, Dr. Sassy. Thank I was you. just curious, um, from Laura's perspective, when you went about like building these presets, it, it's like 60 or so, am I correct, for a ray gun? Around there, yeah. Around there? Something like that. I, yeah. I, yeah, I took a lot of hers and just did um, color variations on them just to kind of spread it a little further. But the, the designs and the initial concept for each as you can see, like I, I left the, yeah. the name of each one as, as one of her designs and then just kind of populated a lot of different uh, variations. Cool. And I was just curious, like when you, um, when Laura, when you were visualizing all of the, the 60 designs and how, and Harry and your work back and forth with the ray gun, was the intention of the designs to give people more of a, like a jumping off point of what it was possible with the ray gun? I was curious how you um, went about expanding the existing uh, 
effects slash templates that were already inside. Yeah, so when Harry and I first started talking about creating the presets for a ray gun, um, I noticed that, um, and also Harry mentioned this, but a lot of the presets for a ray gun were kind of more like geared towards sci-fi and like that sort of aesthetic. And uh, I wanted to create presets that uh, more aligned with like the stuff I do, which is very, you know, rapid, very colorful, that sort of thing. So that was the point of view I was bringing to this. So I uh, drew a lot of inspiration from like Bauhaus and like Scandinavian design. I basically made like Pinterest mood board and I'm like, what are stuff that I would personally use in the, in the uh, when I would personally use and make when I'm doing some for clients. And so um, the stuff I made for a, a ray gun um, reflects that style. So that was what I was going for. Very cool. Um, just in terms of like just looking at a ray gun, because it is quite a big effect. And Dr. Sassy, you did some really good variations of that too. Um, so joint question for you guys both. When you were going to design these mood boards, Dr. Sassy, and you started to look at a ray gun, did you already have something in mind when you first saw a ray gun? And I, I guess, Laura, as a, a follow-up question, because you were mentioning the different ways of, of visualizing how a ray gun was used, I was just curious uh, if you've seen some examples or used a ray gun in your own work too. Um. To be honest, when a universe started eight years ago, I was completely overwhelmed. And um, to look at the first examples, when you see just the ray gun without presets, you think, okay, that looks really boring because you think it, it's close to an Excel sheet. And when you then see all the wonderful presets, you get instantly an idea. There's so much more in it. And um, it's certainly worth to explore the whole area instead of just saying, okay, these are just static stuff, which the presets, the little um, previous here, the, the little icons don't really show what they can do, that they move and change and, and rotate and scale and all of that. And that you get really an, yeah, an kit to create your own things. That is maybe something that I haven't realized many years ago. I have to admit this. And, you know, you get overwhelmed. You say, oh, no, thank you. I know that. And you move on. And working with these has shown me how many things you can change here. And what I like the most um, is when you can just take the background opacity away. And then you can even stack them on top of each other or take one, as I've shown, and distort the next one, maybe. And so they can mm -hmm. interact with uh, displacement, for example. And I have also explored when you take just two of these and set them to red and green, because red and green is in standard displacement in After Effects, you can do so much damage to the picture very quickly and uh, disguise the limit pretty much. So I'm pretty much amazed about what is behind that initially looking Excel sheet like um, option and what you can gain finally from it. And uh, without the presets, I would have not really gotten so deep into it. <laughs> and to be fair, if you're, you were talking about the initial release of Universe, it did not have this preset browser uh, on its first yeah. release. This, this dashboard came out four years ago, maybe. So. Um, yeah. So it was exactly to, to address that issue. We have all these yeah. plugins and people didn't know actually what they had. Some people would go to the website to find what a plugin actually was. Um, so this was added um, to the, I think there were 1100 presets at the time that we uh, oh, deployed. Wow. But, but, yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I would say, because Harry, am I correct that a ray gun came out in universe 3.2? Oh, you're going to quiz me on. That I'm sounds about me. right. 3.0 is all the text. So either 3. Point, yeah, I think 3.2. Okay. So, yeah, and and um, I meant when this effect came out, there was already a certain amount of presets, which, which Dr. Sassy is, is showing over here at the right. Yeah. And I remember when, Laura, you added the expansion of, of your own presets. If I'm correct, Vaporwave is one of the ones that you did, which is a little bit lower. Is that correct, Laura? 
I believe so. It definitely Probably. sounds like something I would do. Yeah, it was just there was some because uh, it's such an extensive plugin, like a Dr. Sassy had said, and even you could spend your entire day just playing with the shape category. Um, it was just amazing to see that expansion of some of the presets that you had done and, and, and these patterns in action. I'm looking right now at Dr. Sassy's screen and I'm I'm pretty sure that the plants were added, some mm -hmm, of the yeah. circuits were added, and just kind of giving such an idea of how versatile this one effect is. It's It could stand alone by itself, <laughs> but it's- Yeah, uh, coming from like a 3D background, I was kind of like frustrated by um, After Effects lack of like repeaters and like cloners, <laughs> and I think a ray gun is like the closest thing that we have to that. So I think that's like a really underrated, but powerful feature of it. That was the whole reason it was it, I was working on a side project and I it was all grid based and I and I is using trap code form and custom particles and I would I reached this frustration point of like why isn't there an easy way to um generate a grid of of things right and there's you know like Laura said there's repeaters and whatnot in After Effects but to not the level of control that I was looking for I wanted to be able to randomize shapes and randomize colors and randomize uh size and randomized position and stuff like that and uh, i guess i was trying to go for something that was kind of in between where trap code form was in terms of it easily makes a grid uh and uh something that also kind of pulls in the the repeaters of, of after effects but a little bit more control and it is a fun you know it started with like i'll just make a grid right and then like okay well we gotta add some shapes and then we added color schemes and all that kind of stuff and then um, it just kind of went from there. And then you start to find like, well, I want it to be able to make this kind of design, like like uh, Dr. Sassy was mentioning, like the, the Memphis style, the, the Milano Memphis style, not Texas, like barbecue or, yeah. type of, or Tennessee, sorry, not Texas. Um, Memphis, that sort of quintessential 90s kind of design. And then I'm like, well, I want it to go in that direction. So then I'm like adding additional grids on top of the shapes um and uh yeah then it just kind of goes from there and it gets a little out of out of control but it is a fun plugin i like to play with it um, i haven't looked at it in a while sorry uh laura do we have prepared something that you can show us or yeah so um sh should i show my screen now you want it? yeah yeah go ahead i can so, uh, pass it over yeah. to you laura here so you should see it in one second that you have a request to take over the screen. Cool, you guys see After Effects? Yep. So um, when uh, Dr. Sassy and I were talking about like the different uses of a ray gun, like one of the things that he brought was um, how to like stack it with um, you know different effects rather than just using it by itself. So um, I kind of like prepared different ways of you can use a ray gun just then by adding, like slapping on the background and calling it a day. So I created this like glitchy um, text, which uh, uses a ray gun as a displacement map. So you can um, apply it to your text, you can apply it to your footage, um, that sort of thing. So. Is that basically the same uh, background? Yeah, as exactly. Displacement map? Okay. Yeah, so um, I just, use the same background as this one but i made it black and white and then i adjusted um the speed and the opacity um like in the animation settings just to make the distortion like more like visible but it's basically the same settings as um the background and then i just applied it as a displacement map um to my text so and i also added uh chromatic aberration because you can not not use chromatic aberration. Um, and then I was just kind of like messing around with like other uses. So I did this like time displacement thing, which is, um, uh, I forget what preset this one is called, but it's just one of the presets where you have like uh, cert holes and shapes, um, just kind of doing this like simple opacity thing. And then I made, I added a circle um, 
with the radiance and then I added a time displacement. So it's just scaling as a very simple scale. And um, it has like this pretty cool like reveal effect. Um, so I would just, uh, you know, just write a man playing around with the ray gun because you can just use it as displacement maps really easily. And you can just zap effects like really quickly and you just create these cool kind of like procedurals so super quickly. Um, here's another example. Um, this is just one of the, the presets and then I added a polar coordinate to make it a circle and then you get this uh, HUD effect really quickly. Um, so I know Red Giant already has like a preset similar to that, but you can make it like more graphical and um, like this super quickly. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to share. Can you give us a little bit more um, of your process? Um, as Nick asked me if I had already an idea or an emotion inside of me when I created these. And uh, in, in my case, I was just interested in getting the most contrast in the picture so people see it's left, middle and, 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 and uh, uh, right. I wasn't really in an aesthetical uh, rush or <laughs> for with my work, and I wouldn't say even that I'm going to make art with that. But for for me, it was more demo uh, level, and I didn't want to compete at all with your work. And I thought we have discussed so much contrast. I thought if I mess it really up, yours look much better which it already does. But we need a little bit more of your process where, where I think um, in one book that Nick suggested to me, the constant remote with a solution when you get um, the task from someone else, to not try to solve it instantly because it blocks your whole process. You think, oh, you're already there, but the more you dump into a scene, the more unmanageable it becomes after a while. And so <laughs> the main idea of, of Nick's book suggestion was um, first lean back, soak it all in, get really dense with your, your wish and idea, and then find ways to express this. Is that something that is similar to your process? To first charge yourself and then find solutions, or is it experimental from the start? Um. Like, are you, I'm sorry, I don't know. What are you okay. asking? Yeah. Um, the simple idea is normally you can go into After Effects and start instantly to experiment. And when you find something that fits to you, you say, okay, I make a preset. Or is your approach more like when I see these names, Bauhaus, for example, that you explored Bauhaus in a book, in a movie, in a documentary, and then say, I want to express this kind of style in my preset. Mm -hmm. so, so what is your, your pathway to a preset? Yeah, um, so when I initially got like the brief and I looked at um, what was already me, uh, basically the first thing I do whenever I get a project is I go on Pinterest and I just look on, the, I just get, uh, gather references from a bunch of different areas. So. I knew I wanted to kind of go in the graphical 90s style because a ray gun has like these grids already built in that would um, really suit that kind of style. Um, I also like these like repeating um, uh, patterns and different shapes. And so I really want to incorporate that into the work. I really wanted um, the stuff to be really fun and vibrant and stuff that people will use. Maybe they're um, maybe they're like editing the video, they need some kind of like background, or you know, they're they're creating like a mood board for um like a style the client wants to go in and they want to really quickly um you know provide some kind of reference so they could um use some of the array gun presets and just 
quickly change the colors or they can uh, turn on and off the grid or um, that sort of thing. So that was um, just kind of like my first initial step was just uh, gathering a bunch of references. Um, I also looked back at some of my uh, old work. So um, I did this project when I was in college and I kind of um, took inspiration from like my older projects that I just kind of just duplicated within a ray gun because um, I knew it was like stuff I had already done so other people like could find um, these from it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I first initially um, started. Cool. I, so, I have, so, sorry, please go ahead. No, no, no. I'm happy when you ask something. <laughs> oh, so I, I just had a follow-up question. Um, a lot of times, like in the process of let's say uh, creating something in in motion graphics, I've found even with a clear idea, it's very possible to go down the wrong path, and that wrong path, you know, eventually gets thrown out because it doesn't relate back to the overall idea or whole. But sometimes along those wrong paths. Uh, you discover like something that looks really cool and awesome, and you this you could basically save it or file it away for later. I was curious in in your design of these presets, what was is or was there a happy accident that you discovered uh, that you didn't even know was possible or wasn't uh, scripted from your Pinterest boards? Like, oh wow, like I I ended up experimenting or trying to go down this way, but I ended up here and it did suit the idea. I was just curious if there was something like that in the collection of presets. Yeah, um, I did a lot of like, experimentation um, when playing around with the array gun. So one of the examples I was like, a uh, happy accident was, um, let me try to find the effects. Oh yeah. So this is like really simple, but um, I was just messing around with the, um, the different like settings and stuff. And um, while while in the process of like messing around with it, I noticed that you could just create this like grid of like circles that repeatedly get smaller and smaller. And I thought that'd be a really interesting textural element to a ray gun that I hadn't considered before because um, I use a lot, of, like my work is very graphic and like illustrated and that sort of thing. So um, I use a lot of textures in my work and before a ray gun, I think the other presets in the ray gun were a little bit <clears throat> a little bit more sci-fi or like a flat. A lot of the color schemes are uh, flat or like colorful, that sort of thing. But I didn't really consider like an overlaying element of it. So um, I could just um, let me just bring a random picture. So I have this picture of an astronaut, and then I have this uh, half tone uh, preset that I made. I could just uh, overlay it onto um, the astronaut and just create, really quickly create a very um, interesting textural element to it. Um, so I, it's like a really simple example, but um, it just kind of opened my eyes to like the different uses of a ray gun that I hadn't um, really considered before. Cool. I, I was curious as well, just to, as one more follow-up question. How many, uh, now that you've spent your time with the ray gun or just universe in general, uh, how many times have you used now universe in your own work or found ways of utilizing that for, for the motion graphics that you're currently working on and, and doing? Uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Harry will probably hate me for saying this, but use the VHS um, one. It's, statistically <laughs> speaking, that's that's the that's the number one plugin by, of usage by far. I think it's twice. If you look at the number two plugin and the number one plugin, which is VHS, the usage is like double from number one to number two. Like it is the the most used. It's like it's such a, a quick and easy way to add like that vintage or like eighties flair to video. So I definitely use that a lot. Cool. And um, so, did in terms of, 
I don't actually have a follow-up question in terms of, of that, but just go, going back to the question I asked you, Laura, to Dr. Sassy, because I love these ideas of, uh, were there any happy accidents that you had when you were playing with a ray gun and how you sort of connected multiple uh, presets that you changed? Well, you started from some presets and then you changed it in terms of animation and design. I was curious if there were any connections that you had found um, in your experimentation and in your mood boards that uh, fit the overall story that you were trying to capture or even add to that story. That was a question to me? That was a question to you. Okay. A long-winded question, but a question to you. <laughs> um, it's sometimes hard to, to uh, decide which part of universe you want to use. And um, honestly, when I would have known a ray gun better, I would have maybe not used so much glitch and I would have built up my own um, set of ray gun layers to have glitch to have that transition from scene five to scene six and um, i like control and i like information flow and uh, typically i play with things get a feeling try to understand the inner logic of it and when i'm charged enough with the idea and i, I get the clarity of what i want to do then i search of course for better options and um, I see more and more that a ray gun can replace a lot of things where I gain at the same time more control over the whole. And that's for me something I think always uh, more appreciated because you go into something and after a while you understand it much better and you want to fine tune it. And the more control you have on the end, is the, the better it is for me at least. So surprises the whole array collection is a yeah, surprise. <laughs> I have not prepared anything to showcase that, but that would be the short answer. I have a question to, to Harry, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, when I apply a new effect to something, I often lose maybe some settings. Of course, because these are presets. Can I save one or two parameters from a previously used preset, like a little uh, lock or so? Um, not not in the saving process, but you can. And in fact, I have to do this for many releases. Um, you can open up the the preset file into any code editor. It, it's the files, we call it an RGX format. Um, it's just a JSON format. Mm -hmm. So you'll see blocks for each uh, parameter, right? So if you want to, and you just have to make sure to not invalidate the JSON by missing a comma or something like that, which is very easy to do. Um, but if you just want it to be like, I apply the preset and it only changes maybe the text in the position or something like that, you can just go through and erase everything else um and just uh awesome. just leave those couple parameters there in fact i do this a lot for each release where things that as you change a parameter you try to think about what as you're experimenting and trying presets what you might change and expect to be there right like if you're working with a lower third and i reposition it and then i'm changing different presets you don't want it resetting your position back to the center every single time you have to apply a preset. It's one of those things you don't think about, but as I make these presets, I have to think about, well, what are people going to want to, you know, does the blend mode change? Does the opacity change? All that kind of stuff. So I'm doing this constantly, but um, yeah, you can just open it up and change it. There would, it would be nice if there was some built-in mechanism. I mean, it can be kind of complicated because like a ray gun has a lot of parameters. Um, so it would be difficult to make some sort of mechanism where you're checking all the things that uh, get saved or don't get saved. Oh, that's cool. I like what Laura's working on right now. Yeah. It's actually really cool to see your process as, as you're playing around with the Vaporwave preset there and trying to combine it with the uh, astronaut image in the in the one by one aspect ratio. I love it. And that just reminded me, uh, Laura, of just a thought about your creative process with the presets, because you also do motion design work. Uh, where you're you're putting together a longer form video project. And I was wondering if the creative process for these presets 
how was it different from your actual motion graphics or was it different? Did you go about it in a different way in terms of, of that design and, and, and coming out with the, the presets that uh, you, you put together for Universe? Yeah, it's definitely different because usually clients come with me with a brief and they have some kind of specific style or maybe they don't have a style, but I kind of develop a style for them. But for them, so it's very open-ended. Like I could basically make whatever I wanted, which is a little bit daunting because I'm like, okay, so I had to think about what I, I was going to... I was trying to find a design brief to talk to that because I did that on purpose because I didn't want to give too much direction because I do so much of the like I'll make the product and I'll make the, the, the presets and the whole point of this is like we want to just get outside of this design style that that is in there already so I didn't want to front load this with any like we'll go in this direction or do this 90s thing or whatever I that's where I I, I pick somebody based on on style and, and ability so so yeah, I was trying to find a design brief because it was, it was basically like, make a bunch of presets, um, maybe backgrounds or something. Um, I can't find the design brief, but there wasn't much to it. But you're right, there was not a lot of direction, but that was kind of by design. But I'm sorry it was daunting at the same time. Oh, I mean, I wasn't saying it's like a bad thing. I'm just saying like, I just had to like think a lot of like, okay, what can I make that I feel like other people would use and like in what context? would they use this and so that was what I was thinking so um, I kind of tried to like go to things that were kind of trendy um, which you know retro is very in you know the 80s the 90s style is very trendy right now um, also like the, the plant one that I did which I can show um, which I've seen a lot in different design briefs um, and that sort of thing so Actually, that'd be pretty cool to ask now right now. <laughs> <laughs> looks like uh, wallpaper. It looks like a, a cool like plant wallpaper to me, almost even texturized in the in the frame. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, people could just use a ray gun and just like layer different like video footage or like still images and um, quickly layer things over. And basically you have something that you could present to a client theoretically or just for fun. Um, so yeah, I think that's the cool thing about it is you can just quickly change things. Um, they have like a bunch of like randomization features. So it, um, you can, uh, like if you want to present your client with a bunch of like different style options, you can quickly just change some of the numbers. So you're not just showing them the same thing over and over. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of uses for, um, like professional projects. Very cool. It just reminded me of a, a feature that I was going to try to put in there, and I had it, and I think I lost the code, but it was a randomize button where it would just literally just randomize every, every parameter in there, kind of like uh, the brainstorm feature that used to be in After Effects, but they, uh, they got rid of it because of technical reasons, I guess. Um, but yeah, you just keep, you can just keep hitting the button and everything will be random. <laughs> Randomize. It was actually quite fun, and I tried to. I, I made it, and then I, I the code regressed, and I lost it, and it's gone. So, but that just reminded me that I should explore that again. Maybe in a future release. Maybe in a future release coming. <laughs> yeah. This actually reminds me, and just to uh, Dr. Sassy, what I I love about what you've constructed is we're able to see the universe effects in different ways. In some cases, not what they were intended to to support the actual storyline. I, I was curious from Harry, have you had the intention for a plugin in the in the past? Then users came around and started using it in a completely different way than you were expecting, and then altered properties of that effect to appeal to that use case. Hmm. Oh, I'm sure there have been examples. You're talking like during development where I was going in one direction and then it kind of went in a different direction. Or even like you've la you launched something and then completely started to change. And then the everybody was like, no, let's do this. Well, I mean, to the first point, analog was designed. It's, you know, it kind of took its own direction. It, analog was designed as like, well, let's take away 
let's design away different than VHS because VHS is more about degradation and uh, it's noise and grain and it's displacing the image. And I wanted something a little uh, more subtle so that it's not just like overlaying all this footage and, and splitting apart the image. I wanted something that had more of an organic feel. And I wanted to kind of like do a lot more sampling of different tape stocks and stuff like that. But in the end, it kind of took its own direction where once I ended up with this um, this new technology of the the 3D uh, project, the screen, right? It's, it's an actual 3D render engine that's, that's projecting it onto this uh, sort of like CRT surface. And kind of went more in that more of the TV CRT pixel kind of thing, different than uh, where I originally had designed it. And I think that was just more in, by influence of the technology at the time, or the what the technology that was kind of dropped in my lap. Um, but I'm trying to think of other things that, that have sort of shifted direction. Nothing. Nothing specific. I mean, the, the the universe glow definitely in its first iteration was just kind of a, a single pass, boring kind of glow. And as the community has sort of developed a more uh, sophisticated taste when it comes to glows, you know, with like deep glow, um, was was I think big, a big influencer with this that people wanted the sort of like inverse square fall off, of, which is good because that's how glows actually should look. Um, so we actually revamped it. Um, the funny thing is the process that I made for Universe Glow, and now there's also Optical Glow, and I talked with them about how they did it and how I did it. And I assumed that there was a way more complicated way or technical way. And it turns out we did it the same way, right? So it's kind of the same process between the Universe Glow, which is now like a multi-pass inverse square fall off glow. Um, so I guess that was a bore. That was more of like my reaction to the community. Like the community was more had a higher expectation for what a glow would be. You know, uh, usually if it's something that's like, hey, we like this thing and it's really cool, but we really want it to do this other thing. Uh, it's honestly better for everybody all around to just make it a new plugin, because as I've found, uh, those with that have struggled with the recent updates of chromatic aberration where I tried to like make new things in it but keep the backwards compatibility. I totally screwed up all the backwards compatibility and ran all these issues and I apologize to everybody that's ever had issues with it. But my learning experience from that is like, well, if we get some new ideas or new technology and we want to take something in a different direction. You know, we're almost at a hundred plugins already. Just make it a new plugin. <laughs> that's that's my learning experience to take my takeaway. Oh, cool. I saw that Isaac has a question. Yes, yes, for you, Dr. Sassy. Yeah, and I've read it. And um, since Simon asked me to um, push pretty much the artistic part in the series as well, the question is perfect. So <laughs> that's why I like to answer it. Um, randomization. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, when you look in all the presets, that's for me a brainstorming area where I normally think in, in presets not to just take them and, and dump them on something but to see where i can go um, laura has um, mentioned pinterest and that reminded me on an uh, incident that we had when we were studying art we drove often to galleries or to museums and, and watched exhibitions and typically one or the other was saying i'm so loaded with stuff that I have no access to my own intuition at the moment because I feel I'm overloaded. So that would be maybe the negative part of getting too much info, too much in, input into you. But typically, if you write down a little bit or make sketches where you want to be and then expose yourself to all these uh, sources, and sometimes these resources are very strong, so that means they can maybe override some little intuition that you have for a certain area and you forgot about it because there's such a strong idea in the internet or wherever. And it's it's not an easy to answer question, but I would say stay open 
be aware that content from the outside can be very strong and might kill your your little plant that is growing uh, if that is a replacement for the idea but um, typically to charge yourself with stuff reacting to presets to stuff that is maybe um, in catalogs in museums or just setting up randomization inside of after effects when you just type in randomly uh, values and, and animate them and render this out and then you get already a huge variety of options but my what i've written on the page two on this pdf is um, why to learn a visual language on your own when so much is already done because learning something means that you get very sensitive to other people's work and post-production means the more you have created on your own the more authentic you are the more freedom you have to see other people's work to see the fine nuances and all of that if you never have written a book if you never have uh, made a movie then chances are that you haven't exposed yourself to all the problems that are on that way so when you see other people's work you might not see all the fine new answers that are there so to expose yourself to random stuff is always good and um, the book is uh, too far away to get it but at the moment i read a book from um, from a brazilian artist who has all these shapes and and whatnot where i have no access at all to it and i read this 500 page book the second time now because I know in the moment I expose myself to something where I have no access to in the first place, I can gain the most. When I do only stuff that I like and say, oh, that attracts me, then I have a very narrow band. And so yes, randomization in parts of your input is very important, but it is also a little bit dangerous. That would be the long answer. You guys remember the brainstorming button in After Effects? I don't think it's still there, but there used to be a, a brainstorming yeah. button with shape layers where you could uh, would uh, have random patterns and and, uh, and and click on that button for some randomization. That, it's interesting, at least talking from the question from the the randomness buttons, because quite a like few pieces of, of of plugins within Red Giant as well as in, in Cinema 4D have these randomness controls like random seed where you have a bunch of, of values and are looking to tweak your design slightly differently or push it in one direction or the other and uh, dr sassy what you said uh, actually reminded me of um, something i learned in video editing from walter merch uh, when you were talking about being exposed to several ideas so walter merch was the editor for francis ford coppola for a number of years and he would speak very loudly about the process of how important it was for him to watch the footage and react to it the first time that he got it because after that moment uh, where he saw the footage the, the rough cut for the initial time it was all objective from there and he called him it called it losing himself in the edit and it's, it's interesting where you get exposed to all of these i think and i'm curious laura's perspective on this too all of these outside perspectives and and need to sort of keep yourself contained before you expose yourself to that and and draw too much let's say from um a specific type of genre but there's the other i guess side to it too where there's client work and you're given a brief and you have to stay within those controls anyways or that style that they're looking for may, may i just answer to um, the more what you said Walter Murch also wrote in one of his books that he refused to go on set to have no impression whatsoever because the audience wouldn't have that kind of input. And as he said, the first contact is with the footage that is what is there for him and not what is in his head memorized from the set because he can't show what he has in the memory. He can only show what is on the footage. Just to and I found the book, by the way. Um, I have no access to all these patterns. I can't see them, I can't understand them, but as she writes, the picture is behind the painting, behind. And uh, it's it's not true, but <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But to get really in into that, 
is for me important because I have experienced it over and over again. After a while, I unlock the artist and then it becomes part of my thinking. Sorry, Laura, to interrupt, but um, I wanted to share these two things. <laughs> so that's an incredible insight, Dr. Sassy. And, and Laura, I was curious because uh, this is picking up from something that Harry had brought up earlier. You were mentioning that in some cases of building like an effect or plugin, it's better to start from scratch. And I wanted to kind of relate that or draw um, a parallel to the motion graphic process. When you're working for clients, Laura, have there been moments where you'll be receiving multiple rounds of feedback and then maybe making some changes to the video along the way? And at the end of the process, maybe realizing I would have been better off starting off from scratch, but we went down this, this process. I was, I was curious if that uh, has ever come up where through the stages of design, um, upon reflection, if you've ever thought it might have been better to start off from the beginning and, and how you make those decisions in that creative process. Oh yeah, like that's happened to me all the time where like through the rounds of feedback, I had to change stuff. And then um, by the end of the project, cause I am a freelancer. So mostly I work with other people and I'm often sending my project files to like a studio or agency. And so at the end of the project, I realized, whoa, I built this project in the way just because of be that that be impossible for some brand new to like open my project and like change things quickly because like the process had gotten so convoluted that I was making adjustments as the feedback came, but it would be hard for someone to come into the project fresh base and had to know what's going on because the um, I could just start over and animate it something super quickly, but since I'm forced to use my old project files for this whole project, so it's just become this like shot, this like web of um of messes that like for the purpose like I finished the video, it works for the purposes of the video, but it's just not an easy project file to work in. Um so I think uh it can be really easy when you're in the thick of a project to just keep doing what you've been doing and like adjust with um, you know, in terms of timing, there's new, a new voice over or whatever. Um, but it's also, you have to know when it's okay to start over. And I had that late start over um, mid projects. So I had deleted everything in the pre-com and just, um, uh, you know, just uh, reanimate it just cause I know it, was, it would be easier just to start over than just to like figure out um, from all those layers, like where everything is, so. I know we've been also very focused on a ray gun, but you did some stuff for typographic as well. I don't know, mm -hmm. Dr. Sassy, did you get a chance to play with the typographic in the design? I don't think so. That text was 3D from Cinema 4D, but um, typographic is sort of a a text template engine. Am I correct, Harry, in, in saying that? Where you could you have shapes as well as 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 text that you can. Uh, manipulate without yeah. keyframes, which I'm a big fan of. I have yeah. used fact, it to I, info. Yeah. In fact, I think, I mean, Laura did a bunch of presets for this one as well. And I, yeah. I think, well, no, I think there were more array gun presets, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it is mostly, I don't want to say it's like a lower third maker, but it is generally all the stuff that you need to do a, a title in one effect, right? It's got, two different text generators that you can mix your, your fonts, and it's got two different shape generators built in, as well as you can use custom layers or you, there's a shape library built in. One of the cool things about it uh, that, you know, if somebody's like, well, why would I use this over After Effects or whatever? Well, one of the big things that you can do is that any host app that is running typographic or running universe, um, you can share this with any other host app, right? So you can design an After Effects and you can hand it over to somebody in Resolve or you can hand it to somebody in Media Composer or whatever, or, you know, mix and match. Um, and because these um, ship with, I think, 60 or so open source fonts, um, that was a struggle we ran into. It was like, well, we can make all these and we're going to be limited to Gil Sands and Times New Roman and every, you know, horrible set of fonts that is cross-platform between Mac OS and Windows. So we, with the installer, unless you opt out of it, which we allow you, um, we put 60 open source fonts in there. 
so that our designs can be that much more uh, interesting. Um, so yeah, so I can design a lower third here in After Effects, I can send it to somebody in Media Composer, or I can send it to somebody in Final Cut, and it will, in theory, uh, look the same. So that's one of the big pluses of it. When I see um, lower third and, and as well as main titles, and I think about brands in the uh, in the conversation of motion graphics, it is a way I think of helping your workflow in terms of automation. If you had a brand and the, the story behind it, where you could take one of these uh, templates cross platform, like you're saying, Harry, or cross system, even cross systems, and mm -hmm. manipulate the template towards that story of that that brand or um, the titles that you're using and uh, sort of guide that process. Let's say if the, if uh, Dr. Sassy, if this uh, the what you put together was a multi series, you know, there's going to be elements of 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 what were created in the initial design, which would have a lot more time spent. But you could then take some of those aspects of the effects that you made to make things look terrible to support the story. The same thing would be true here, where we could take any of these um, presets that you put together, Laura. You could manipulate this uh, for that brand or that story, and you can save it as a preset. And like Harry was saying, save it cross platform, which I think um, could be a great tool when you have a, a lot of video that you're putting together and trying to keep it within one unified, uh, cohesive story. Yeah, I work a lot with like video editors who have like no idea what they're doing in After Effects, and like lower thirds are like the most common form of like graphics I get to video editors and um, you know if I create something like super complex and they have to like go in and change the text or change the colors it can be a really cumbersome process for the both of us so, so having something that's like all in one where you can you know exactly where to edit text edit the colors the duration etc um, is very useful for that like back and forth between emotion graphics and video editing. Very cool. And when I look to the time, I think we have already overdrafted. And I would love to ask Nick, because he was, I think, most of the time guest or contributor to this show, what would be the best advice for anyone listening through the whole series, how to continue, how to explore? Because I know you have a huge amount of knowledge and experience in motion graphic design. And you had from the whole show so far today, the least amount of questions. So the question goes to you. Oh, the question. <laughs> so, uh, so where to continue this? Well, first of all, thank everyone for so much for attending, for those of you who have attended over these four weeks and uh, taking part, Dr. Sassy, in this amazing, um, story that you you put together allowing people to see a universe in a completely different light uh, my my first piece of advice to add on to that was the files that you handed out um, available in the handout section like i can't believe the amount of time that you've spent on this it's it, it shows there's a ton of resources and i twirl down that handout section and check out uh, the overarching story if you're just tuning in today uh, we have those three previous weeks up on the Maxon training team page, and you can pick up from week one, uh, watching that right now. I'll put up that link there in a second. I also think wanted to thank Laura. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge as a motion graphic expert and someone who built all of these presets. And I'll put up your website in a second. Is there anywhere else that you wanted people to reach out to you to kind of see the work that you have done and how you're applying, whether it's this or, or VHS to your projects? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you can follow me on all social media platforms. I'm at Laura Peroff. So at Laura I'm Peroff. active on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, and I think that the Maxon training team page has a, a bunch of knowledge in terms of, of, of motion graphics, but the, the story that you put here, Dr. Sassy, is a great place to start. Check out that handout and check out the Maxon training team page. And my final thank you is to Harry, who's come here for two weeks and shared a ton of information about how universe works and thinks in terms of effects orders, not to mention uh, just to, uh, how he's kind of come out with some of those creative concepts. So thank you so much. And I think you should just give out your email to everyone for future requests. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but um, 
I I always forget this, Harry. If you, is there a, a section uh, under the universe plugin where someone could give a piece of feedback if they wanted to? At... You'd think. I mean, the I think um, you can. You know, I think that's what social media really is for. I mean, people take a lot of support issues to to social media, and every single time we direct them to call support and talk to a living, breathing human being to help them with their issue. But I think a more practical use of social media to engage with people is to hit us up on, on social media and give us requests and, and engage with us there, like on Twitter. Um, so we have, well, we're still kind of stuck in limbo with two different, uh, we, we have the Red Giant News Twitter, and then we have the Max on VFX Twitter as well. And I think we're still kind of tending to both of those. Um, and I am, uh, I'm on there as well, Gray Machine, G-R-A-Y Machine. Um, you can always hit me directly. Not going to give out my email, though. <laughs> it was worth a shot. I had to try for the audience, I feel. But I think that's, um, sorry, Dr. Sassy, to sum up, those were my, my three recommendations. So the information that you provided, check out some of Laura's work, as well as, Harry, Frank, you just uh, I provided an extension for providing feedback as people work with with universe and of course make things as terrible as they they can be for for the projects make it organic, make it like organic. It. <laughs> and i'll just put up just a few screens here because i know it's well past one o'clock but here's that max on training team page and just to let everyone there my screen went away you'll find this in the terrible links uh, again in the handouts and here thank you again Laura here's uh, Laura Porat's website and then you mentioned at Laura Porat in order to reach out on social media and see some of her her work cool and awesome yeah the rest of the information in terms of the free t-shirt as well as the code uh, which you should act on because that code expires at the end of the month uh, check out in the handouts so you'll have a link as well as the I believe it's zero nine terrible or terrible <laughs> zero nine, all one caps. of the two, all caps. So try it, but it's definitely in the links. And do you have the certification page open? I don't. Um, if you give me a second, I, I yeah. will bring it up. I'm just going to stop showing my screen so you don't see me typing. But uh, Dr. Sassy, there's a question. Is there any preferred oh. uh, public social media for yourself to follow on? So maybe I hand over the screen to you just if you had a, a web no, page. No, I... I had Google Plus and that was pretty successful <laughs> and then they closed it and I was pretty frustrated. I said so much time. Is that my screen now? No, no. No, this, it's, uh, a, it's no one's screen right now. Um, let me put it that way. I have a YouTube page where I have 200 tutorials, photography for 3D artists, where I had the idea to give people the the, the knowledge what is needed when you photograph and you want to put that world into your 3D scene. Whatever you need to know is inside of that. I have researched it over two years. It's not just quickly um, put together and, oh, I have an idea, I do it. Uh, it's more decades than I try to um, admit on experience in it. <laughs> and otherwise, Dr. Sassi, one, one words.com is my page where I have my photography and there you can see my my whole universe of my art in my head. How I think, why I think, or why I do some, some stuff. That's pretty much all. I think cineversity.com is the place to find me since 15 years and a half by now. <laughs> awesome. No, that's great. I, I have seen it all. <laughs> You have a ton of stuff up there on the on the Cineversity page, and then thanks for so, so much for sharing your website to Dr. Sassy and everyone. This is the certification link. You can go to maxon.net um, uh, slash certification to find out more info. Uh, uh, Laura, there was just a, a lovely comment from Aaron here in the chat. Just loves your time and expertise, and that des desktop um, that you're using for your website loves it, and was asking if that was a wallpaper engine. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's not a desktop engine. Uh, there is a website called Cargo Paletta, um, and uh, it's similar to Squarespace, and they have a 
the they have a, a template that you use that's very similar to the one that I use. So I would check out that website. Cool. I can't believe another month has gone by in the demystifying series. And again, thank you, everyone here, Laura, Dr. Sassy, and Harry, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And thanks everyone here for listening. It looks like there's some MoGraph next month for um, Cinema 4D that's going to be released in terms of schedule on the Maxon events page. So don't forget to check out the handouts included at the bottom, which has all the links, including uh, the terrible links to the free t-shirt and the code. And let me say thank you to everyone who came to the show. It was an idea from Simon, and I made only the script, but the whole thing wouldn't be possible with all the guests and all the ideas and information, contribution, and it was fun to do. The text was a lot of work to put together. I hope at least a few <laughs> people read it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, could, uh, I could easily make a whole semester's worth of... Um, it could be a like a, a blueprint for a, in a whole class, really, like going through all the ideas that you've put in there. It's very dense with with ideas and ex explorations on technical and creative concepts. So I highly recommend everybody go through it. Thank you. Wow. Yep. That's very nice of you. That's what I want, that everyone can open their creative, creative doors as wide as possible and keeps going. Yeah. That's the target. <laughs> and Alberto was just chiming in and saying lots of great information, almost like a whole course worth Dr. Yeah. Sassen. And I can't wait to uh, grab a coffee tomorrow morning and go through your entire document versus skimming through it this morning, what you put together. It's awesome. Cool. It's, I think, 30 pages of typed information squeezed into a little PDF. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That was Have wonderful. Day, morning, afternoon, Thank you. everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks Dr. Sassy. Thank, Thank you. you again. Bye. Bye. Bye.